Chapter Thirteen of Part Two of Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Part Two, Chapter Thirteen. Men who are complete strangers and wholly indifferent to one another, if they live a long time together, are sure both of them to expose something of their inner nature and thus a kind of intimacy will arise between them. All the more was it to be expected that there would soon be no secrets between our two friends, now that they were again under the same roof together, and in daily and hourly intercourse. They went over again the earlier stages of their history, and the Major confessed to Edward that Charlotte had intended Ottilie for him at the time at which he returned from abroad, and hoped that some time or other he might marry her. Edward was in ecstasies at this discovery, he spoke without reserve of the mutual affection of Charlotte and the Major, which, because it happened to fall in so conveniently with his own wishes, he painted in very lively colours. Deny it altogether, the Major could not. At the same time, he could not altogether acknowledge it. But Edward only insisted on it the more. He had pictured the whole thing to himself not as possible, but as already concluded. All parties had only to resolve on what they all wished. There would be no difficulty in obtaining a separation. The marriages should follow as soon after as possible, and Edward could travel with Ottilie. Of all the pleasant things which imagination pictures to us, perhaps there is none more charming than when lovers and young married people look forward to enjoying their new relation to each other in a fresh new world, and test the endurance of the bond between them in so many changing circumstances. The Major and Charlotte were in the meantime to have unrestricted powers to settle all questions of money, property, and other such important worldly matters, and to do whatever was right and proper for the satisfaction of all parties. What Edward dwelt the most upon, however, what he seemed to promise himself the most advantage from, was this. As the child would have to remain with the mother, the Major would charge himself with the education of it. He would train the boy according to his own views, and develop what capacities there might be in him. It was not for nothing that he had received in his baptism the name of Otto, which belonged to them both. Edward had so completely arranged everything for himself, that he could not wait another day to carry it into execution. On their way to the castle they arrived at a small town, where Edward had a house, and where he was to stay to await the return of the Major. He could not, however, prevail upon himself to alight there at once, and accompanied his friend through the place. They were both on horseback, and falling into some interesting conversation, rode on further together. On a sudden they saw in the distance the new house on the height, with its red tiles shining in the sun. An irresistible longing came over Edward. He would have it all settled that very evening. He would remain concealed in a village close by. The Major was to urge the business on Charlotte with all his power. He would take her prudence by surprise, and oblige her by the unexpectedness of his proposal to make a free acknowledgment of her feelings. Edward had transferred his own wishes to her, he felt certain that he was only meeting her half-way, and that her inclinations were as decided as his own, and he looked for an immediate consent from her, because he himself could think of nothing else. Joyfully he saw the prosperous issue before his eyes, and that it might be communicated to him as swiftly as possible, a few cannon-shots were to be fired off, and if it was dark, a rocket or two sent up. The Major rode to the castle. He did not find Charlotte there. He learnt that for the present she was staying at the new house, at that particular time, however, she was paying a visit in the neighbourhood, and she probably would not have returned till late that evening. He walked back to the hotel, to which he had previously sent his horse. Edward, in the meantime, unable to sit still from restlessness and impatience, stole away out of his concealment along solitary paths, only known to foresters and fishermen, into his park, and he found himself towards evening in the copse close to the lake, the broad mirror of which he now for the first time saw spread out in its perfectness before him. Ottilie had gone out that afternoon for a walk along the shore. She had the child with her, and read as she usually did while she went along. She had gone as far as the oak tree by the ferry. The boy had fallen asleep. She sat down, laid it on the ground at her side, and continued reading. The book was one of those which attract persons of delicate feeling, and afterwards will not let them go again. She forgot the time and the hours. She never thought what a long way round it was by land to the new house, but she sat lost in her book and in herself so beautiful to look at, that the trees and the bushes round her ought to have been alive, and to have had eyes given them to gaze upon her and admire her. The sun was sinking, a ruddy streak of light fell upon her from behind, tinging with gold her cheek and shoulder. Edward, who had made his way to the lake without being seen, finding his park desolate and no trace of human creature to be seen anywhere, went on and on. 
At last he broke through the copse behind the oak tree and saw her. At the same moment she saw him. He flew to her and threw himself at her feet. After a long silent pause in which they both endeavoured to collect themselves, he explained in a few words why and how he had come there. He had sent the major to Charlotte, and perhaps at that moment their common destiny was being decided. Never had he doubted her affection, and she assuredly had never doubted his. He begged for her consent, she hesitated, he implored her. He offered to resume his old privilege and throw his arms around her and embrace her. She pointed down to the child. Edward looked at it and was amazed. "'Great God!' he cried. "'If I had cause to doubt my wife and my friend, this face would witness fearfully against them. Is not this the very image of the Major? I never saw such a likeness.' "'Indeed,' replied Ottilie. "'All the world say it is like me.' "'Is it possible?' Edward answered. And at the moment the child opened its eyes, two large black piercing eyes, deep and full of love. Already the little face was full of intelligence. He seemed as if he knew both the figures which he saw standing before him. Edward threw himself down beside the child and then knelt a second time before Ottilie. "'It is you,' he cried. "'The eyes are yours. Ah, but let me look into yours. Let me throw a veil over that ill-starred hour which gave its being to this little creature. Shall I shock your pure spirit with the fearful thought that man and wife who are estranged from each other can yet press each other to their heart and profane the bonds by which the law unites them by other eager wishes? Oh, yes. As I have said so much, as my connection with Charlotte must now be severed, as you will be mine, why should I not speak out the words to you? This child is the offspring of a double adultery. It should have been a tie between my wife and myself, but it severs her from me and me from her. Let it witness, then, against me. Let these fair eyes say to yours that in the arms of another I belong to you. You must feel, Ottilie, oh, you must feel that my fault, my crime, I can only expiate in your arms." Hark! he called out, as he sprang up and listened. He thought that he had heard a shot, and that it was the sign which the Major was to give. It was the gun of a forester on the adjoining hill. Nothing followed. Edward grew impatient. Ottilie now first observed that the sun was down behind the mountains. Its last rays were shining on the windows of the house above. "'Leave me, Edward,' she cried. "'Go! Long as we have been parted, much as we have borne, yet remember what we both owe to Charlotte. She must decide our fate. Do not let us anticipate her judgment. I am yours if she will permit it to be so. If she will not, I must renounce you. As you think it is now so near an issue, let us wait. Go back to the village where the Major supposes you to be. Is it likely that a rude cannon-shot will inform you of the results of such an interview? Perhaps at this moment he is seeking for you. He will not have found Charlotte at home, of that I am certain. He may have gone to meet her, for they knew at the castle where she was. How many things may have happened! Leave me! She must be at home by this time. She is expecting me with the baby above. Ottilie spoke hurriedly. She called together all the possibilities. It was too delightful to be with Edward, but she felt that he must now leave her. I beseech, I implore you, my beloved, she cried out, go back and wait for the Major. I obey your commands, cried Edward. He gazed at her for a moment with rapturous love, and then caught her close in his arms. She wound her own about him and pressed him tenderly to her breast. Hope streamed away like a star shooting in the sky above their heads. They thought then, they believed, that they did indeed belong to one another. For the first time they exchanged free, genuine kisses, and separated with pain and effort. The sun had gone down. It was twilight, and a damp mist was rising about the lake. Ottilie stood confused and agitated. She looked across to the house on the hill, and she thought she saw Charlotte's white dress on the balcony. It was a long way round by the end of the lake, and she knew how impatiently Charlotte would be waiting for the child. She saw the plane trees just opposite her, and only a narrow interval of water divided her from the path which led straight up to the house. Her nervousness about venturing on the water with the child vanished in her present embarrassment. She hastened to the boat. She did not feel that her heart was beating, that her feet were tottering, that her senses were threatening to fail her. She sprang in, seized the oar, and pushed off. She had to use force. She pushed again. The boat shot off and glided, swaying and rocking, into the open water. With the child in her left arm, the book in her left hand, and the oar in her right, she lost her footing and fell over the seat. The oar slipped from her on one side, and as she tried to recover herself, the child and book slipped on the other, all into the water. She caught the floating dress, but lying entangled as she was herself, she was unable to rise. Her right hand was free, but she could not reach round to help herself up with it. At last she succeeded. She drew the child out of the water, but its eyes were closed. 
and it had ceased to breathe. In a moment she recovered all her self-possession, but so much the greater was her agony. The boat was driving fast into the middle of the lake. The oar was swimming far away from her. She saw no one on the shore, and indeed if she had, it would have been of no service to her. Cut off from all assistance, she was floating on the faithless, unstable element. She sought for help from herself. She had often heard of the recovery of the drowned. She had herself witnessed an instance of it on the evening of her birthday. She took off the child's clothes and dried it with her muslin dress. She threw open her bosom, laying it bare for the first time to the free heaven. For the first time she pressed a living being to her pure naked breast. Alas, and it was not a living being. The cold limbs of the ill-starred little creature chilled her to the heart. Streams of tears gushed from her eyes and lent a show of life and warmth to the outside of the torpid limbs. She persevered with her efforts. She wrapped it in her shawl. She drew it close to herself, stroked it, breathed upon it, and with tears and kisses laboured to supply the help which, cut off as she was, she was unable to find. It was all in vain. The child lay motionless in her arms. Motionless the boat floated on the glassy water. But even here her beautiful spirit did not leave her forsaken. She turned to the power above. She sank down upon her knees in the boat, and with both arms raised the unmoving child above her innocent breast, like marble in its whiteness, alas, too, like marble cold. With moist eyes she looked up and cried for help, where tender heart hopes to find it in its fullness, when all other help has failed. The stars were beginning one by one to glimmer down upon her. She turned to them, and not in vain. A soft air stole over the surface, and wafted the boat under the plane trees. End of chapter 13《ハプトゥーティーオブエレクティブアフィニティス》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee.《エレクティブアフィニティス》Part 2 by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 14 She hurried to the new house and called the surgeon and gave the child into his hands. It was carried at once to Charlotte's sleeping room. Cool and collected from a wide experience, he submitted the tender body to the usual process. Ottilie stood by him through it all. She prepared everything, she fetched everything, but as if she were moving in another world, for the height of misfortune, like the height of happiness, alters the aspect of every object. And it was only when after every resource had been exhausted, the good man shook his head, and to her questions whether there was hope, first was silent, and then answered with a gentle no that she left the apartment, and had scarcely entered the sitting-room when she fell fainting, with her face upon the carpet, unable to reach the sofa. At that moment Charlotte was heard driving up. The surgeon implored the servants to keep back and allow him to go to meet her and prepare her, but he was too late. While he was speaking she had entered the drawing-room. She found Ottilie on the ground, and one of the girls of the house came running and screaming to her, open-mouthed. The surgeon entered at the same moment, and she was informed of everything. She could not at once, however, give up all hope. She was flying upstairs to the child, but the physician besought her to remain where she was. He went himself to deceive her with a show of fresh exertions, and she sat down upon the sofa. Ottilie was still lying on the ground. Charlotte raised her, and supported her against herself, and her beautiful head sank down upon her knee. The kind medical man went backwards and forwards. He appeared to be busy about the child. His real care was for the ladies, and so came on midnight, and the stillness grew more and more deathly. Charlotte did not try to conceal from herself any longer that her child would never return to life again. She desired to see it now. It had been wrapped up in warm woollen coverings, and it was brought down as it was, lying in its cot which was placed at her side on the sofa. The little face was uncovered, and there it lay in its calm, sweet beauty. The report of the accident soon spread through the village. Everyone was roused, and the story reached the hotel. The major hurried up the well-known road. He went round and round the house. At last he met a servant who was going to one of the outbuildings to fetch something. He learned from him in what state things were, and desired him to tell the surgeon that he was there. The latter came out, not a little surprised at the appearance of his old patron. He told him exactly what had happened, and undertook to prepare Charlotte to see him. He then went in, began some conversation to distract her attention, and led her imagination from one object to another till at last he brought it to rest upon her friend, and the depth of feeling and of sympathy which would surely be called out in him. From the imaginative she was brought at once to the real. Enough! 
she was informed that he was at the door, that he knew everything, and desired to be admitted. The major entered. Charlotte received him with a miserable smile. He stood before her. She lifted off the green silk covering under which the body was lying, and by the dim light of a taper he saw before him, not without a secret shudder, the stiffened image of himself. Charlotte pointed to a chair, and there they sat opposite to one another without speaking through the night. Ottilie was still lying motionless on Charlotte's knee. She breathed softly and slept, or seemed to sleep. The morning dawned, the lights went out, the two friends appeared to awake out of a heavy dream. Charlotte looked towards the Major and said quietly, "'Tell me through what circumstances you have been brought hither to take part in this morning scene.' "'The present is not a time,' the Major answered, in the same low tone as that in which Charlotte had spoken, for fear lest she might disturb Ottilie. "'This is not a time, and this is not a place for reserve. The condition in which I find you is so fearful that even the earnest matter on which I am here loses its importance by the side of it.' He then informed her, quite calmly and simply, of the object of his mission in so far as he was the ambassador of Edward, of the object of his coming, in so far as his own free will and his own interests were concerned in it. He laid both before her, delicately but uprightly. Charlotte listened quietly, and showed neither surprise nor unwillingness. As soon as the Major had finished, she replied in a voice so light that to catch her words he was obliged to draw his chair closer to her. In such a case as this I have never before found myself, but in similar cases I have always said to myself, How will it be to-morrow? I feel very clearly that the fate of many persons is now in my hands, and what I have to do is soon said without scruple or hesitation. I consent to the separation. I ought to have made up my mind to it before. By my unwillingness and reluctance I have destroyed my child. There are certain things on which destiny obstinately insists. In vain may reason, may virtue, may duty, may all holy feelings place themselves in its way. Something shall be done which to it seems good, and which to us seems not good and it forces its own way through at last, let us conduct ourselves as we will. And indeed, what am I saying? It is but my own desire, my own purpose, against which I acted so unthinkingly, which destiny is again bringing in my way? Did I not long ago, in my thoughts, design Edward and Ottilie for one another? Did I not myself labour to bring them together? And you, my friend, you yourself were an accomplice in my plot. Why? Why could I not distinguish mere man's obstinacy from real love? Why did I accept his hand when I could have made him happy as a friend, and when another could have made him happy as a wife? And now look here on this unhappy slumberer. I tremble for the moment when she'll recover out of this half-death sleep into consciousness. How can she endure to live? How shall she ever console herself if she may not hope to make good that to Edward, of which, as the instrument of the most wonderful destiny, she has deprived him? And she can make it all good again by the passion, by the devotion with which she loves him, if love be able to bear all things, it is able to do yet more. It can restore all things. Of myself at such a moment I may not think. Do you go quietly away, my dear Major? Say to Edward that I consent to the separation, that I leave it to him, to you, and to Mittler to settle whatever is to be done. I have no anxiety for my own future condition. It may be what it will. It is nothing to me. I will subscribe whatever paper is submitted to me, only he must not require me to join actively. I cannot have to think about it or give advice. The Major rose to go. She stretched out her hand to him across Ottilie. He pressed it to his lips and whispered gently, And for myself? May I hope anything? Do not ask me now, replied Charlotte. I will tell you another time. We have not deserved to be miserable, but neither can we say that we have deserved to be happy together. The Major left her and went, feeling for Charlotte to the bottom of his heart, but not being able to be sorry for the fate of the poor child. Such an offering seemed necessary to him for their general happiness. He pictured Ottilie to himself with a child of her own in her arms as the most perfect compensation for the one of which she had deprived Edward. He pictured himself with his own son on his knee, who should have better right to resemble him than the one which was departed. With such flattering hopes and fancies passing through his mind, he returned to the hotel, and on his way back he met Edward, who had been waiting for him the whole night through in the open air since neither rocket nor report of cannon would bring him news of the successful issue of his undertaking. He had already heard of the misfortune, and he too, instead of being sorry for the poor creature, regarded what had befallen it, without being exactly ready to confess it to himself, as a convenient accident, through which the only impediment in the way of his happiness was at once removed. The Major at once informed him of his wife's resolution, and he therefore easily allowed himself to be prevailed upon to return again with him to the village, 
and from thence to go for a while to the little town, where they would consider what was next to be done, and make their arrangements. After the Major had left her, Charlotte sat on, buried in her own reflections, but it was only for a few minutes. Ottilie suddenly raised herself from her lap, and looked full with her large eyes in her friend's face. Then she got up from off the ground, and stood upright before her. This is the second time, began the noble girl, with an irresistible solemnity of manner. This is the second time that the same thing has happened to me. You once said to me that similar things often befall people more than once in their lives in a similar way, and if they do, it is always at important moments. I now find that what you said is true, and I have to make a confession to you. Shortly after my mother's death, when I was a very little child, I was sitting one day on a footstool, close to you. You were on the sofa, as you are at this moment, and my head rested on your knees. I was not asleep, I was not awake, I was in a trance. I knew everything which was passing about me, I heard every word which was said with the greatest distinctness, and yet I could not stir, I could not speak, and if I had wished it I could not have given a hint that I was conscious. On that occasion you were speaking about me to one of your friends. You were commiserating my fate, left as I was a poor orphan in the world. You described my dependent position, and how unfortunate a future was before me, unless some very happy star watched over me. I understood well what you said. I saw, perhaps too clearly, what you appeared to hope of me, and what you thought I ought to do. I made rules to myself, according to such limited insight as I had, and by these I have long lived. By these, at the time when you so kindly took charge of me, and had me with you in your home, I regulated whatever I did, and whatever I left undone. But I have wandered out of my course, I have broken my rules, I have lost the very power of feeling them. And now, after a dreadful occurrence, you have again made clear to me my situation, which is more pitiable than the first. While lying in a half torpor on your lap, I have again, as if out of another world, heard every syllable which you uttered. I know from you how all is with me. I shudder at the thought of myself. But again, as I did then, in my half-sleep of death, I have marked out my new path for myself. I am determined, as I was before, and what I have determined I must tell you at once. I will never be Edward's wife. In a terrible manner, God has opened my eyes to see the sin in which I was entangled. I will atone for it, and let no one think to move me from my purpose. It is by this, my dearest, kindest friend, that you must govern your own conduct. Send for the Major to come back to you. Write to him that no steps must be taken. It made me miserable that I could not stir or speak when he went. I tried to rise. I tried to cry out. Oh, why did you let him leave you with such unlawful hopes? Charlotte saw Ottilie's condition, and she felt for it but she hoped that by time and persuasion she might be able to prevail upon her, on her uttering a few words, however, which pointed to a future, to a time when her sufferings would be alleviated, and when there might be better room for hope. No, Ottilie cried, with vehemence, do not endeavour to move me, do not seek to deceive me. At the moment at which I learn that you have consented to the separation, in that same lake I will expiate my errors and my crimes. End of chapter 14《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデーありがとうございます》。《ハッピーバースデー even more than is right or necessary, a subject of constant conversation. They talked to each other of their plans and their occupations, and, without exactly taking one another's advice, consider and discuss together the entire progress of their lives. But this is far from being the case in serious moments. Just when it would seem men most require the assistance and support of others, they all draw singly within themselves every one to act for himself, every one to work in his own fashion. They conceal from one another the particular means which they employ, and only the result, the object, the thing which they realise, is again made common property. After so many strange and unfortunate incidents, a sort of silent seriousness had passed over the two ladies, which showed itself in a sweet mutual effort to spare each other's feelings. The child had been buried privately in the chapel. It rested there as the first offering to a destiny full of ominous foreshadowings. Charlotte, as soon as ever she could, turned back to life and occupation, and here she first found Ottilie standing in need of her assistance. She occupied herself almost entirely with her, without letting it be observed. She knew how deeply the noble girl loved Edward. She had discovered, by degrees, the scene which had preceded the accident, and had gathered every circumstance of it. 
partly from Ottilie herself, partly from the letters of the Major. Ottilie, on her side, made Charlotte's immediate life much more easy for her. She was open and even talkative, but she never spoke of the present, or of what had lately passed. She had been a close and thoughtful observer. She knew much, and now it all came to the surface. She entertained, she amused Charlotte, and the latter still nourished a hope in secret to see her married to Edward after all. But something very different was passing in Ottilie. She had disclosed the secret of the course of her life to her friend, and she showed no more of her previous restraint and submissiveness. By her repentance and her resolution she felt herself freed from the burden of her fault and her misfortune. She had no more violence to do to herself. In the bottom of her heart she had forgiven herself solely under condition of the fullest renunciation, and it was a condition which would remain binding for all time to come. So passed away some time, and Charlotte now felt how deeply house and park and lake and rocks and trees served to keep alive in them all their most painful reminiscences. They wanted change of scene, both of them. It was plain enough. But how it was to be effected was not so easy to decide. Were the two ladies to remain together? Edward's previously expressed will appeared to enjoin it. His declarations and his threats appeared to make it necessary. Only it could not be now mistaken that Charlotte and Ottilie, with all their good will, with all their sense, with all their efforts to conceal it, could not avoid finding themselves in a painful situation towards one another. In their conversation there was a constant endeavour to avoid doubtful subjects. They were often obliged only half to understand some illusion. More often expressions were misinterpreted, if not by their understandings, at any rate by their feelings. They were afraid to give pain to one another, and this very fear itself produced the evil which they were seeking to avoid. If they were to try change of scene, and at the same time, at any rate for a while, to part, the old question came up again, where Ottilie was to go. There was a grand rich family who still wanted a desirable companion for their daughter, the attempts to find a person whom they could trust having hitherto proved ineffectual. The last time the baroness had been at the castle, she had urged Charlotte to send Ottilie there, and she had been lately pressing it again and again in her letters. Charlotte now a second time proposed it, but Ottilie expressly declined going anywhere, where she would be thrown into what is called the great world. Do not think me foolish or self-willed, my dear aunt, she said. I had better tell you what I feel, for fear you should judge hardly of me, although in any other case it would be my duty to be silent. A person who has fallen into uncommon misfortunes, however guiltless he may be, carries a frightful mark upon him. His presence, in every one who sees him and is aware of his history, excites a kind of horror. People see in him the terrible fate which has been laid upon him, and he is the object of a diseased and nervous curiosity. It is so with a house, it is so with a town, where any terrible action has been done. People enter them with awe, the light of day shines less brightly there, and the stars seem to lose their lustre. Perhaps we ought to excuse it, but how extreme is the indiscretion with which people behave towards such unfortunates, with their foolish importunities and awkward kindness? You must forgive me for speaking in this way, but that poor girl whom Luciana tempted out of her retirement, and with such mistaken good nature tried to force into society and amusement, has haunted me and made me miserable. The poor creature, when she was so frightened and tried to escape, and then sank and swooned away, and I caught her in my arms, and the party came all crowding round in terror and curiosity. Little did I think then that the same fate was in store for me. But my feeling for her is as deep and warm and fresh as ever it was, and now I may direct my compassion upon myself, and secure myself from being the object of any similar exposure. But, my dear child, answered Charlotte, you will never be able to withdraw yourself where no one can see you. We have no cloisters now. Otherwise there, with your present feelings, would be your resource. Solitude would not give me the resource for which I wish, my dear aunt, answered Ottilie. The one true and valuable resource is to be looked for where we can be active and useful. All the self-denials and all the penances on earth will fail to deliver us from an evil omen destiny, if it be determined to persecute us. Let me sit still in idleness and serve as a spectacle for the world, and it will overpower me and crush me. But find me some peaceful employment where I can go steadily and unweariedly on doing my duty, and I shall be able to bear the eyes of men, when I need not shrink under the eyes of God. Unless I am much mistaken, replied Charlotte, your inclination is to return to the school. Yes, Ottilie answered, I do not deny it. I think it a happy destination to train up others in the beaten way, after having been trained in the strangest myself. And do we not see the same great fact in history? Some moral calamity drives men out into the wilderness, but they are not allowed to remain as they had hoped in their concealment there. They are summoned back into the world, to lead the wanderers into the right way. And who are fitter for such a service 
than those who have been initiated into the labyrinths of life. They are commanded to be the support of the unfortunate, and who can better fulfil that command than those who have no more misfortunes to fear upon earth? You are selecting an uncommon profession for yourself, replied Charlotte. I shall not oppose you, however. Let it be as you wish. Only I hope it will be but for a short time. Most warmly I thank you, said Ottilie, for giving me leave at least to try, to make the experiment. If I am not flattering myself too highly, I am sure I shall succeed. Wherever I am, I shall remember the many trials which I went through myself, and how small, how infinitely small they were, compared to those which I afterwards had to undergo. It will be my happiness to watch the embarrassments of the little creatures as they grow, to cheer them in their childish sorrows, and guide them back with a light hand out of their little aberrations. The fortunate is not the person to be of help to the fortunate. It is in the nature of man to require ever more and more of himself and others, the more he has received. The unfortunate who has himself recovered knows best how to nourish in himself and them the feeling that every moderate good ought to be enjoyed with rapture. I have but one objection to make to what you propose, said Charlotte, after some thought, although that one seems to me of great importance. I am not thinking of you, but of another person. You are aware of the feelings towards you of that good, right-minded, excellent assistant. In the way in which you desire to proceed, you will become every day more valuable and more indispensable to him. Already he himself believes that he can never live happily without you, and hereafter, when he has become accustomed to have you to work with him, he will be unable to carry on his business if he loses you. You will have assisted him at the beginning, only to injure him in the end. Destiny has not dealt with me with too gentle a hand, replied Ottilie, and whoever loves me has perhaps not much better to expect. Our friend is so good and so sensible that I hope he will be able to reconcile himself to remaining in a simple relation with me. He will learn to see in me a consecrated person lying under the shadow of an awful calamity, and only able to support herself and bear up against it by devoting herself to that holy being who is invisibly around us, and alone is able to shield us from the dark powers which threaten to overwhelm us. All this which the dear girl poured out so warmly, Charlotte privately reflected over. On many different occasions, although only in the gentlest manner, she had hinted at the possibility of Ottilie's being brought again in contact with Edward, but the slightest mention of it, the faintest hope, the least suspicion, seemed to wound Ottilie to the quick. One day, when she could not evade it, she expressed herself to Charlotte clearly and peremptorily on the subject. If your resolution to renounce Edward, returned Charlotte, is so firm and unalterable, then you had better avoid the danger of seeing him again. At a distance from the object of our love, the warmer our affection, the stronger is the control which we fancy that we can exercise on ourselves, because the whole force of the passion, diverted from its outward objects, turns inwards on ourselves. But how soon, how swiftly is our mistake made clear to us, when the thing which we thought that we could renounce, stands again before our eyes as indispensable to us. You must now do what you consider best suited to your circumstances. Look well into yourself, change if you prefer it, the resolution which you have just expressed, but do it of yourself, with a free consenting heart. Do not allow yourself to be drawn in by an accident, do not let yourself be surprised into your former position. It will place you at issue with yourself, and will be intolerable to you. As I said, before you take this step, before you remove from me and enter upon a new life, which will lead you, no one knows in what direction, consider once more whether really, indeed, you can renounce Edward for the whole time to come. If you have faithfully made up your mind that you will do this, then will you enter into an engagement with me, that you will never admit him into your presence, and if he seeks you out and forces himself upon you, that you will not exchange words with him. Ottilie did not hesitate a moment. She gave Charlotte the promise, which she had already made to herself. Now, however, Charlotte began to be haunted with Edward's threat, that he would only consent to renounce Ottilie, as long as she was not parted from Charlotte. Since that time, indeed, circumstances were so altered, so many things had happened, that an engagement which was wrung from him in a moment of excitement might well be supposed to have been cancelled. She was unwilling, however, in the remotest sense, to venture anything or to undertake anything which might displease him, and Mittler was therefore to find Edward and inquire what, as things now were, he wished to be done. Since the death of the child, Mittler had often been at the castle to see Charlotte, although only for a few moments at a time. The unhappy accident which had made her reconciliation with her husband in the highest degree improbable had produced a most painful effect upon him. But ever as his nature was, hoping and striving, he rejoiced secretly at the resolution of Ottilie. He trusted to the softening influence of passing time. He hoped that it might still be possible to keep the husband and the wife from separating, 
and he tried to regard these convulsions of passion only as trials of wedded love and fidelity. Charlotte at the very first had informed the Major by letter of Ottilie's declaration. She had entreated him most earnestly to prevail on Edward to take no further steps for the present. They should keep quiet and wait and see whether the poor girl's spirits would recover. She had let him know from time to time whatever was necessary of what had more lately fallen from her, and now Mittler had to undertake the really difficult commission of preparing Edward for an alteration in her situation. Mittler, however, well knowing that men can be brought more easily to submit to what is already done than to give their consent to what is yet to be done, persuaded Charlotte that it would be better to send Ottilie off at once to the school. Consequently, as soon as Mittler was gone, preparations were at once made for the journey. Ottilie put her things together, and Charlotte observed that neither the beautiful box nor anything out of it was to go with her. Ottilie had said nothing to her on the subject, and she took no notice, but let her alone. The day of the departure came. Charlotte's carriage was to take Ottilie the first day, as far as a place where they were well known, where she was to pass the night, and on the second she would go on in it to the school. It was settled that Nanny was to accompany her and remain as her attendant. This capricious little creature had found her way back to her mistress after the death of the child, and now hung about her as warmly and passionately as ever. Indeed, she seemed, with her loquacity and attentiveness, as if she wished to make good her past neglect, and henceforth devote herself entirely to Ottilie's service. She was quite beside herself now for joy at the thought of travelling with her and of seeing strange places, when she had hitherto never been away from the scene of her birth, and she ran from the castle to the village to carry the news of her good fortune to her parents and her relations, and to take leave. Unluckily for herself, she went among other places into a room where a person was who had the measles, and caught the infection, which came out upon her at once. The journey could not be postponed. Ottilie herself was urgent to go. She had travelled once already the same road. She knew the people of the hotel where she was to sleep. The coachman from the castle was going with her. There could be nothing to fear. Charlotte made no opposition. She, too, in thought, was making haste to be clear of present embarrassments. The rooms which Ottilie had occupied at the castle she would have prepared for Edward as soon as possible, and restored to the old state in which they had been before the arrival of the captain. The hope of bringing back old happy days burns up again and again in us, as if it never could be extinguished. And Charlotte was quite right, there was nothing else for her except to hope as she did. End of chapter 15of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by nicole lee elective affinities part two by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter sixteen when mittler was come to talk the matter over with edward he found him sitting by himself with his head supported on his right hand and his arm resting on the table he appeared in great suffering is your headache troubling you again asked mittler it is troubling me answered he and yet i cannot wish it were not so for it reminds me of ottilie she too i say to myself is also suffering in the same way at this same moment and suffering more perhaps than i and why cannot i bear it as well as she these pains are good for me i might almost say that they were welcome for they serve to bring out before me with the greater vividness her patience and all her other graces it is only when we suffer ourselves that we feel really the true nature of all the high qualities which are required to bear suffering. Mittler, finding his friend so far resigned, did not hesitate to communicate the message with which he had been sent. He brought it out piecemeal, however, in order of time, as the idea had itself arisen between the ladies and had gradually ripened into a purpose. Edward scarcely made an objection. From the little which he said, it appeared as if he was willing to leave everything to them the pain which he was suffering at the moment making him indifferent to all besides scarcely however was he again alone then he got up and walked rapidly up and down the room he forgot his pain his attention now turning to what was external to himself mittler's story had stirred the embers of his love and awakened his imagination in all its vividness he saw ottilie by herself or as good as by herself travelling on a road which was well known to him in a hotel with every room of which he was familiar he thought he considered or rather he neither thought nor considered he only wished he only desired he would see her he would speak to her why or for what good end that was to come of it he did not care to ask himself but he made up his mind at once he must do it 
He summoned his valet into his council, and through him he made himself acquainted with the day and hour when Ottilie was to set out. The morning broke. Without taking any person with him, Edward mounted his horse, and rode off to the place where she was to pass the night. He was there too soon. The hostess was overjoyed at the sight of him. She was under heavy obligations to him for a service which he had been able to do for her. Her son had been in the army, where he had conducted himself with remarkable gallantry. He had performed one particular action of which no one had been a witness but Edward, and the latter had spoken of it to the commander-in-chief in terms of such high praise, that notwithstanding the opposition of various ill-wishers, he had obtained a decoration for him. The mother, therefore, could never do enough for Edward. She got ready her best room for him, which indeed was her own wardrobe and storeroom, with all possible speed. He informed her, however, that a young lady was coming to pass the night there, and he ordered an apartment for her at the back, at the end of the gallery. It sounded a mysterious sort of affair, but the hostess was ready to do anything to please her patron, who appeared so interested and so busy about it. And he, what were his sensations as he watched through the long, weary hours till evening? He examined the room round and round in which he was to see her. With all its strangeness and homeliness, it seemed to him to be an abode for angels. He thought over and over what he had better do, whether he should take her by surprise, or whether he should prepare her for meeting him. At last the second course seemed the preferable one. He sat down and wrote a letter which she was to read. Edward to Ottilie. While you read this letter, my best beloved, I am close to you. Do not agitate yourself. Do not be alarmed. You have nothing to fear from me. I will not force myself upon you. I will see you or not, as you yourself shall choose. Consider, oh, consider your condition and mine. How must I not thank you that you have taken no decisive step? but the step which you have taken is significant enough. Do not persist in it. Here, as it were, at a parting of the ways, reflect once again. Can you be mine? Will you be mine? Oh, you will be showing mercy on us all if you will, and on me infinite mercy. Let me see you again, happily, joyfully see you once more. Let me make my request to you with my own lips. And do you give me your answer, your own beautiful self, on my breast, utterly, where you have so often rested? and which belongs to you for ever. As he was writing, the feeling rushed over him that what he was longing for was coming, was close, would be there almost immediately. By that door she would come in, she would read that letter, she in her own person would stand there before him, as she used to stand, she for whose appearance he had thirsted so long. Would she be the same as she was? Was her form, were her feelings changed? He still held the pen in his hand. He was going to write as he thought, when the carriage rolled into the court. With a few hurried strokes he added, I hear you coming. For a moment, farewell. He folded the letter and directed it. He had no time for sealing. He darted into the room through which there was a second outlet into the gallery, when the next moment he recollected that he had left his watch and seals lying on the table. She must not see these first. He ran back and brought them away with him. At the same instant he heard the hostess in the antechamber, showing Ottilie the way to her apartments. He sprang to the bedroom door. It was shut. In his haste, as he had come back for his watch, he had forgotten to take out the key which had fallen out and lay the other side. The door had closed with a spring, and he could not open it. He pushed at it with all his might, but it would not yield. Oh, how gladly would he have been a spirit to escape through its cracks in vain! He hid his face against the panels. Ottilie entered, and the hostess, seeing him, retired. From Ottilie herself, too, he could not remain concealed for a moment. He turned towards her, and there stood the lovers once more, in such strange fashion, in one another's presence. She looked at him, calmly and earnestly, without advancing or retiring. He made a movement to approach her, and she withdrew a few steps towards the table. He stepped back again. Ottilie, he cried aloud. Ottilie, let me break this frightful silence. Are we shadows, that we stand thus gazing at each other? Only listen to me. Listen to this, at least. It is an accident that you find me here thus. There is a letter on the table, at your side there, which was to have prepared you. Read it, I implore you, read it, and then determine as you will. She looked down at the letter, and after thinking a few seconds, she took it up, opened it, and read it. She finished it without a change of expression, and she laid it lightly down. Then joining the palms of her hands together, turning them upwards, and drawing them against her breast, she leant her body a little forward, and regarded Edward with such a look that, Eager as he was, he was compelled to renounce everything he wished or desired of her. Such an attitude cut him to the heart. He could not bear it. 
it seemed exactly as if she would fall upon her knees before him if he persisted he hurried in despair out of the room and leaving her alone sent the hostess in to her he walked up and down the antechamber night had come on and there was no sound in the room at last the hostess came out and drew the key out of the lock the good woman was embarrassed and agitated not knowing what it would be proper for her to do at last as she turned to go she offered the key to edward who refused it and putting down the candle she went away in misery and wretchedness edward flung himself down on the threshold of the door which divided him from ottilie moistening it with his tears as he lay a more unhappy night had been seldom passed by two lovers in such close neighbourhood day came at last the coachman brought round the carriage and the hostess unlocked the door and went in ottilie was asleep in her clothes she went back and beckoned to edward with a significant smile they both entered and stood before her as she lay but the sight was too much for edward he could not bear it she was sleeping so quietly that the hostess did not like to disturb her but sat down opposite her waiting till she woke at last ottilie opened her beautiful eyes and raised herself on her feet she declined taking any breakfast and then edward went in again and stood before her he entreated her to speak but one word to him to tell him what she desired he would do it be it what it would he swore to her but she remained silent he asked her once more passionately and tenderly whether she would be his with downcast eyes and with the deepest tenderness of manner she shook her head to a gentle no he asked if she still desired to go to the school without any show of feeling she declined would she then go back to charlotte she inclined her head in token of assent with a look of comfort and relief he went to the window to give directions to the coachman and when his back was turned she darted like lightning out of the room and was down the stairs and in the carriage in an instant the coachman drove back along the road which he had come the day before and edward followed at some distance on horseback End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter seventeen it was with the utmost surprise that charlotte saw the carriage drive up with ottilie and edward at the same moment ride into the courtyard of the castle she ran down to the hall ottilie alighted and approached her and edward violently and eagerly she caught the hands of the wife and husband pressed them together and hurried off to her own room edward threw himself on charlotte's neck and burst into tears he could not give her any explanation he besought her to have patience with him and to go at once to see ottilie charlotte followed her to her room and she could not enter it without a shudder it had been all cleared out there was nothing to be seen but the empty walls, which stood there looking cheerless, vacant, and miserable. Everything had been carried away except the little box, which from an uncertainty what was to be done with it had been left in the middle of the room. Ottilie was lying stretched upon the ground, her arm and head leaning across the cover. Charlotte bent anxiously over her and asked what had happened, but she received no answer. Her maid had come with the restoratives. Charlotte left her with Ottilie, and herself hastened back to Edward she found him in the saloon but he could tell her nothing he threw himself down before her he bathed her hands with tears he flew to his own room and she was going to follow him thither when she met his valet from this man she gathered as much as he was able to tell the rest she put together in her own thoughts as well as she could and then at once set herself resolutely to do what the exigencies of the moment required ottilie's room was put to rights again as quickly as possible edward found his to the last paper exactly as he had left it the three appeared again to fall into some sort of relation with one another but ottilie persevered in her silence and edward could do nothing except entreat his wife to exert a patience which seemed wanting to himself charlotte sent messengers to mittler and to the major the first was absent from home and could not be found the latter came to him edward poured out all his heart confessing every most trifling circumstance to him, and thus Charlotte learned fully what had passed, what it had been which had produced such violent excitement, and how so strange an alteration of their mutual position had been brought about. She spoke with the utmost tenderness to her husband, 
She had nothing to ask of him, except that for the present he would leave the poor girl to herself. Edward was not insensible to the worth, the affection, the strong sense of his wife. But his passion absorbed him exclusively. Charlotte tried to cheer him with hopes. She promised that she herself would make no difficulties about the separation. But it had small effect with him. He was so much shaken that hope and faith alternately forsook him. A species of insanity appeared to have taken possession of him. He urged Charlotte to promise to give her hand to the Major. To satisfy him and to humour him, she did what he required. She engaged to become herself the wife of the Major, in the event of Ottilie consenting to the marriage with Edward, with this express condition, however, that for the present the two gentlemen should go abroad together. The Major had a foreign appointment from the court, and it was settled that Edward should accompany him. They arranged it all together, and in doing so found a sort of comfort for themselves, in the sense that at least something was being done. In the meantime, they had to remark that Ottilie took scarcely anything to eat or drink. She still persisted in refusing to speak. They at first used to talk to her, but it appeared to distress her, and they left it off. We are not, universally at least, so weak as to persist in torturing people for their good. Charlotte thought over what could possibly be done. At last she fancied it might be well to ask the assistant of the school to come to them. He had much influence with Ottilie, and had been writing with much anxiety to inquire the cause of her not having arrived at the time he had been expecting her, but as yet she had not sent him any answer. In order not to take Ottilie by surprise, they spoke of their intention of sending this invitation in her presence. It did not seem to please her. She thought for some little time. At last she appeared to have formed some resolution. She retired to her own room, and before the evening sent the following letter to the assembled party. Ottilie to her friends. Why need I express in words, my dear friends, what is in itself so plain? I have stepped out of my course, and I cannot recover it again. A malignant spirit which has gained power over me seems to hinder me from without, even if within I could again become at peace with myself. My purpose was entirely firm to renounce Edward and to separate myself from him for ever. I had hoped that we might never meet again. It has turned out otherwise. Against his own will he stood before me. Too literally, perhaps, I have observed my promise never to admit him into conversation with me. My conscience and the feelings of the moment kept me silent towards him at the time, and now I have nothing more to say. I have taken upon myself, under the accidental impulse of the moment, a difficult vow, which, if it had been formed deliberately, might perhaps be painful and distressing. Let me now persist in the observance of it, so long as my heart shall enjoin it to me. Do not call in any one to mediate. Do not insist upon my speaking. Do not urge me to eat or to drink more than I absolutely must. Bear with me and let me alone, and so help me on through the time. I am young, and youth has many unexpected means of restoring itself. Endure my presence among you. Cheer me with your love. Make me wiser and better with what you say to one another, but leave me to my own inward self. The two friends had made all preparation for their journey, but their departure was still delayed by the formalities of the foreign appointment of the Major, a delay most welcome to Edward. Ottilie's letter had roused all his eagerness again. He had gathered hope and comfort from her words, and now felt himself encouraged and justified in remaining and waiting. He declared, therefore, that he would not go. It would be folly indeed, he cried, of his own accord to throw away, by over-precipitateness, what was most valuable and most necessary to him, when, although there was a danger of losing it, there was nevertheless a chance that it might be preserved. What is the right name of conduct such as that, he said? It is only that we desire to show that we are able to will and to choose. I myself, under the influences of the same ridiculous folly, have torn myself away, days before there was any necessity for it from my friends, merely that I might not be forced to go by the definite expiration of my term. This time I will stay. What reason is there for my going? Is she not already removed far enough from me? I am not likely now to catch her hand or press her to my heart. I could not even think of it without a shudder. She has not separated herself from me. She has raised herself far above me. And so he remained as he desired, as he was obliged. But he was never easy except when he found himself with Ottilie. She too had the same feeling with him. She could not tear herself away from the same happy necessity. On all sides they exerted an indescribable, almost magical attraction over one another. 
living as they were under one roof without even so much as thinking of each other although they might be occupied with other things or diverted this way or that way by the other members of the party they always drew together if they were in the same room in a short time they were sure to be either standing or sitting near each other they were only easy when as close together as they could be but they were then completely easy to be near was enough there was no need for them either to look or to speak they did not seek to touch one another or make sign or gesture but merely to be together then there were not two persons there was but one person in unconscious and perfect content at peace with itself and with the world so it was that if either of them had been imprisoned at the further end of the house the other would by degrees without intending it have moved towards its fellow till he found it life to them was a riddle the solution of which they could only find in union ottilie was throughout so cheerful and quiet that they were able to feel perfectly easy about her she was seldom absent from the society of her friends all that she had desired was that she might be allowed to eat alone with no one to attend upon her but nanny what habitually befalls any person repeats itself more often than one is apt to suppose because his own nature gives the immediate occasion for it character individuality inclination tendency locality circumstance and habits form together a whole in which every man moves as in an atmosphere and where only he feels himself at ease in his proper element and so we find men of whose changeableness so many complaints are made after many years to our surprise unchanged and in all the infinite tendencies outward and inward unchangeable thus in the daily life of our friends almost everything glided on again in its old smooth track ottilie still displayed by many silent attentions her obliging nature and the others like her continued each themselves and then the domestic circle exhibited an image of their former life so like it that they might be pardoned if at any time they dreamt that it might all be again as it was the autumn days which were of the same length with those old spring days brought the party back into the house out of the air about the same hour the gay fruits and flowers which belonged to the season might have made them fancy it was now the autumn of that first spring and the interval dropped out and forgotten for the flowers which now were blooming were the same as those which then they had sown and the fruits which were now ripening on the trees were those which at that time they had seen in blossom the major went backwards and forwards and mittler came frequently the evenings were generally spent in exactly the same way edward usually read aloud with more life and feeling than before much better and even it may be said with more cheerfulness it appeared as if he was endeavouring by light-heartedness as much as by devotion to quicken ottilie's torpor into life and dissolve her silence he seated himself in the same position as he used to do that she might look over his book he was uneasy and distracted unless she was doing so unless he was sure that she was following his words with her eyes every trace had vanished of the unpleasant ungracious feelings of the intervening time no one had any secret complaint against another there were no cross-purposes no bitterness the major accompanied charlotte's playing with his violin and edward's flute sounded again as formerly in harmony with ottilie's piano thus they were now approaching edward's birthday which the year before they had missed celebrating this time they were to keep it without any outward festivities in quiet enjoyment among themselves they had so settled it together half expressly half from a tacit agreement as they approached nearer to this epoch however an anxiety about it which had hitherto been more felt than observed became more noticeable in ottilie's manner she was to be seen often in the garden examining the flowers she had signified to the gardener that he was to save as many as he could of every sort and that she had been especially occupied with the asters which this year were blooming in immense profusion End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of part two of elective affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Part two. Chapter eighteen. The most remarkable feature, however, which was observed about Ottilie was that, for the first time, she had now unpacked the box and had selected a variety of things out of it which she had cut up and which were intended evidently to make one complete suit for her the rest with nanny's assistance she had endeavoured to replace again and she had been hardly able to get it done the space being over full although a portion had been taken out the covetous little nanny could never satisfy herself with looking at all the pretty things 
especially as she found provision made there for every article of dress which could be wanted even the smallest numbers of shoes and stockings garters with devices on them gloves and various other things were left and she begged ottilie just to give her one or two of them ottilie refused to do that but opened a drawer in her wardrobe and told the girl to take what she liked the latter hastily and awkwardly dashed in her hand and seized what she could running off at once with her booty to show it off and display her good fortune among the rest of the servants at last ottilie succeeded in packing everything carefully into its place she then opened a secret compartment which was contrived in the lid where she kept a number of notes and letters from edward many dried flowers the mementos of their early walks together a lock of his hair and various other little matters she now added one more to them her father's portrait and then locked it all up and hung the delicate key by a gold chain about her neck against her heart in the meantime her friends had now in their hearts begun to entertain the best hopes for her charlotte was convinced that she would one day begin to speak again she had latterly seen signs about her which implied that she was engaged in secret about something a look of cheerful self-satisfaction a smile like that which hangs about the face of persons who have something pleasant and delightful which they are keeping concealed from those whom they love no one knew that she spent many hours in extreme exhaustion and that only at rare intervals when she appeared in public through the power of her will she was able to rouse herself mittler had latterly been a frequent visitor and when he came he stayed longer than he usually did at other times this strong-willed resolute person was only too well aware that there is a certain moment in which alone it will answer to smite the iron ottilie's silence and reserve he interpreted according to his own wishes no steps had as yet been taken towards the separation of the husband and wife he hoped to be able to determine the fortunes of the poor girl in some not undesirable way he listened he allowed himself to seem convinced he was discreet and unobtrusive and conducted himself in his own way with sufficient prudence there was but one occasion on which he uniformly forgot himself when he found an opportunity for giving his opinion upon subjects to which he attached a great importance he lived much within himself and when he was with others his only relation to them generally was in active employment on their behalf but if once when among friends his tongue broke fairly loose as on more than one occasion we have already seen he rolled out his words in utter recklessness whether they wounded or whether they pleased whether they did evil or whether they did good the evening before the birthday the major and charlotte were sitting together expecting edward who had gone out for a ride mittler was walking up and down the saloon ottilie was in her own room laying out the dress which she was to wear on the morrow and making signs to her maid about a number of things which the girl who perfectly understood her silent language arranged as she was ordered mittler had fallen exactly on his favourite subject one of the points on which he used most to insist was that in the education of children as well as in the conduct of nations there was nothing more worthless and barbarous than laws and commandments forbidding this and that action man is naturally active he said wherever he is and if you know how to tell him what to do he will do it immediately and keep straight in the direction in which you set him i myself in my own circle am far better pleased to endure faults and mistakes till i know what the opposite virtue is that i am to enjoin than to be rid of the faults and to have nothing good to put in their place a man is really glad to do what is right and sensible if he only knows how to get at it it is no such great matter with him he does it because he must have something to do and he thinks no more about it afterwards than he does of the silliest freaks which he engaged in out of the purest idleness i cannot tell you how it annoys me to hear people going over and over those ten commandments in teaching children the fifth is a thoroughly beautiful rational preceptive precept thou shalt honour thy father and thy mother if the children will inscribe that well upon their hearts they have the whole day before them to put it in practice but the sixth now what can we say to that thou shalt do no murder as if any man ever felt the slightest general inclination to strike another man dead men will hate sometimes they will fly into passions and forget themselves and as a consequence of this or other feelings it may easily come now and then to a murder but what a barbarous precaution it is to tell children that they are not to kill or murder if the commandment ran have a regard for the life of another put away whatever can do him hurt save him though with peril to yourself if you injure him consider that you are injuring yourself that is the form which should be in use among educated reasonable people and in our catechism teaching we have only an awkward clumsy way of sliding into it through a what do you mean by that and as for the seventh that is utterly detestable What? 
to stimulate the precocious curiosity of children to pry into dangerous mysteries to obtrude violently upon their imaginations ideas and notions which beyond all things you should wish to keep from them it were far better if such actions as that commandment speaks of were dealt with arbitrarily by some secret tribunal than prated openly of before church and congregation at this moment ottilie entered the room thou shalt not commit adultery mittler went on how coarse how brutal what a different sound it has if you let it run thou shalt hold in reverence the bond of marriage when thou seest a husband and a wife between whom there is true love thou shalt rejoice in it and their happiness shall gladden thee like the cheerful light of a beautiful day if there arise anything to make division between them thou shalt use thy best endeavour to clear it away thou shalt labour to pacify them and to soothe them to show each of them the excellencies of the other thou shalt not think of thyself but purely and disinterestedly thou shalt seek to further the well-being of others and make them feel what a happiness is that which arises out of all duty done and especially out of that duty which holds man and wife indissolubly bound together charlotte felt as if she was sitting on hot coals the situation was the more distressing as she was convinced that mittler was not thinking the least where he was or what he was saying and before she was able to interrupt him she saw ottilie after changing colour painfully for a few seconds rise and leave the room charlotte constrained herself to seem unembarrassed you will leave us the eighth commandment she said with a faint smile all the rest replied mittler if i may only insist first on the foundation of the whole of them at this moment nanny rushed in screaming and crying she's dying the young lady's dying come to her come ottilie had found her way back with extreme difficulty to her own room the beautiful things which she was to wear the next day were laid out on a number of chairs and the girl who had been running from one to the other staring at them and admiring them called out in her ecstasy look dearest madam only look there is a bridal dress worthy of you ottilie heard the word and sank upon the sofa nanny saw her mistress turn pale fall back and faint she ran for charlotte who came the medical friend was on the spot in a moment he thought it was nothing but exhaustion he ordered some strong soup to be brought ottilie refused it with an expression of loathing it almost threw her into convulsions when they put the cup to her lips a light seemed to break on the physician he asked hastily and anxiously what ottilie had taken that day the little girl hesitated he repeated his question and she then acknowledged that ottilie had taken nothing there was a nervousness of manner about nanny which made him suspicious he carried her with him into the adjoining room charlotte followed and the girl threw herself on her knees and confessed that for a long time past ottilie had taken as good as nothing at her mistress's urgent request she had herself eaten the food which had been brought for her she had said nothing about it because ottilie had by signs alternately begged her not to tell any one and threatened her if she did and as she innocently added because it was so nice the major and mittler now came up as well they found charlotte busy with the physician the pale beautiful girl was sitting apparently conscious in the corner of the sofa they had begged her to lie down she had declined to do this but she made signs to have her box brought and resting her feet upon it placed herself in an easy half recumbent position she seemed to be wishing to take leave and by her gestures was expressing to all about her the tenderest affection love gratitude entreaties for forgiveness and the most heartfelt farewell edward on alighting from his horse was informed of what had happened he rushed to the room threw himself down at her side and seizing her hand deluged it with silent tears in this position he remained a long time at last he called out and am i never more to hear your voice will you not turn back toward life to give me one single word well then very well i will follow you yonder and there we will speak in another language she pressed his hand with all the strength she had she gazed at him with a glance full of life and full of love and drawing a long breath and for a little while moving her lips inarticulately with a tender effort of affection she called out promise me to live and then fell back immediately i promise i promise he cried to her but he cried only after her she was already gone after a miserable night the care of providing for the loved remains fell upon charlotte the major and mittler assisted her edward's condition was utterly pitiable his first thought when he was in any degree recovered from his despair and able to collect himself was that ottilie should not be carried out of the castle she should be kept there and attended upon as if she were alive for she was not dead it was impossible that she should be dead they did what he desired at least so far as that they did not do what he had forbidden 
he did not ask to see her. There was now a second alarm and a further cause for anxiety. Nanny, who had been spoken to sharply by the physician, had been compelled by threats to confess, and after her confession had been overwhelmed with reproaches, had now disappeared. After a long search she was found, but she appeared to be out of her mind. Her parents took her home, but the gentlest treatment had no effect upon her, and she had to be locked up for fear she should run away again. They succeeded by degrees in recovering Edward from the extreme agony of despair, but only to make him more really wretched. He now saw clearly, he could not doubt now, that the happiness of his life was gone from him for ever. It was suggested to him that if Ottilie was placed in the chapel, she would still remain among the living, and it would be a calm, quiet, peaceful home for her. There was much difficulty in obtaining his consent. He would only give it under condition that she should be taken there in an open coffin, that the vault in which she was laid, if covered at all, should be only covered with glass, and a lamp should be kept always burning there. It was arranged that this should be done, and then he seemed resigned. They clothed the delicate body in the festal dress which she had herself prepared. A garland of asters was wreathed about her head, which shone sadly there like melancholy stars. To decorate the bier in the church and chapel, the gardens were robbed of their beauty. They lay desolate as if a premature winter had blighted all their loveliness. In the earliest morning she was born in an open coffin out of the castle, and the heavenly features were once more reddened with the rising sun. The mourners crowded about her as she was being taken along. None would go before. None would follow. Everyone would be where she was. Everyone would enjoy her presence for the last time. Men and women, and little boys, there was not one unmoved, least of all to be consoled were the girls, who felt most immediately what they had lost. Nanny was not present, it had been thought better not to allow it, and they had kept secret from her the day and the hour of the funeral. She was at her parents' house, closely watched, in a room looking towards the garden, but when she heard the bells tolling she knew too well what they meant, and her attendant having left her out of curiosity to see the funeral, she escaped out of the window into a passage, and from thence, finding all the doors locked, into an upper open loft. At this moment the funeral was passing through the village, which had been all freshly strewed with leaves. Nanny saw her mistress plainly close below her, more plainly, more entirely, than any one in the procession underneath. She appeared to be lifted above the earth, borne as it were on clouds or waves, and the girl fancied she was making signs to her. Her senses swam, she tottered, swayed herself for a moment on the edge, and fell to the ground. The crowd fell asunder on all sides with a cry of horror. In the tumult and confusion, the bearers were obliged to set down the coffin. The girl lay close by it. It seemed as if every limb was broken. They lifted her up, and by accident or providentially, she was allowed to lean over the body. She appeared indeed to be endeavouring with what remained to her of life to reach her beloved mistress. Scarcely, however, had the loosely hanging limbs touched Ottilie's robe, and the parlous finger rested on the folded hands, than the girl started up, and first raising her arms and eyes towards heaven, flung herself down upon her knees before the coffin, and gazed with passionate devotion at her mistress. At last she sprang as if inspired from off the ground, and cried with a voice of ecstasy, "'Yes, she has forgiven me! What no man, what I myself, could never have forgiven! God forgives me through her look, her motion, her lips! Now she is lying again so still and quiet, but you saw how she raised herself up and unfolded her hands and blessed me, and how kindly she looked at me! You all heard, you can witness that she said to me, "'You are forgiven! I am not a murderess any more. She has forgiven me! God has forgiven me, and no one may now say anything more against me. The people stood crowding around her. They were amazed. They listened and looked this way and that, and no one knew what should next be done. Bear her on to her rest, said the girl. She has done her part, she has suffered, and cannot now remain any more among us. The bier moved on, Nanny now following it, and thus they reached the church and the chapel. So now stood the coffin of Ottilie, with the child's coffin at her head, and her box at her feet enclosed in a resting place of massive oak. A woman had been provided to watch the body for the first part of the time, as it lay there so beautifully beneath its glass covering. But Nanny would not permit this duty to be taken from herself. She would remain alone without a companion, and attend to the lamp which was now kindled for the first time, and she begged to be allowed to do it with so much eagerness and perseverance that they let her have her way, to prevent any greater evil that might ensue. But she did not long remain alone, as night was falling and the hanging lamp began to exercise its full right and shed abroad a larger lustre, 
The door opened, and the architect entered the chapel. The chastely ornamented walls in the mild light looked more strange, more awful, more antique, than he was prepared to see them. Nanny was sitting on one side of the coffin. She recognised him immediately, but she pointed in silence to the pale form of her mistress. And there stood he on the other side, in the vigour of youth and of grace, with his arms drooping and his hands clasped piteously together, motionless, with head and eye inclined over the inanimate body. Once already he had stood thus before in the Belisarius. He had now involuntarily fallen into the same attitude. And this time how naturally! Here too was something of inestimable worth thrown down from its high estate. There were courage, prudence, power, rank and wealth in one single man, lost irrevocably. There were qualities which in decisive moments had been of indispensable service to the nation and the prince, but which, when the moment was past, were no more valued, but flung aside and neglected and cared for no longer. And here were many other silent virtues, which had been summoned but a little time before by nature out of the depths of her treasures, and now swept rapidly away again by her callous hand, rare, sweet, lovely virtues, whose peaceful workings the thirsty world had welcomed, while it had them with gladness and joy, and now was sorrowing for them in unveiling desire. Both the youth and the girl were silent for a long time. But when she saw the tears streaming fast down his cheeks, and he appeared to be sinking under the burden of his sorrow, she spoke to him with so much truthfulness and power, with such kindness and such confidence that, astonished at the flow of her words, he was able to recover himself, and he saw his beautiful friend floating before him in the new life of a higher world. His tears ceased flowing, his sorrow grew lighter. On his knees he took leave of Ottilie, and with a warm pressure of the hand of Nanny, he rode away from the spot into the night, without having seen a single other person. The surgeon had, without the girl being aware of it, remained all night in the church, and when he went in the morning to see her, he found her cheerful and tranquil. He was prepared for wild aberrations. He thought that she would be sure to speak to him of conversations which she had held in the night with Ottilie, and of other such apparitions. But she was natural, quiet, and perfectly self-possessed. She remembered accurately what had happened in her previous life, she could describe the circumstances of it with the greatest exactness, and never in anything which she said stepped out of the course of what was real and natural, except in her account of what had passed with the body, which she delighted to repeat again and again, how Ottilie had raised herself up, had blessed her, had forgiven her, and thereby set her at rest for ever. Ottilie remained so long in her beautiful state, which more resembled sleep than death, that a number of persons were attracted there to look at her. The neighbours and the villagers wished to see her again, and every one desired to hear Nanny's incredible story from her own mouth. Many laughed at it, most doubted, and some few were found who were able to believe. Difficulties, for which no real satisfaction is attainable, compel us to faith. Before the eyes of all the world Nanny's limbs had been broken, and by touching the sacred body she had been restored to strength again. Why should not others find similar good fortune? Delicate mothers first privately brought their children, who were suffering from obstinate disorders, and they believed that they could trace an immediate improvement. The confidence of the people increased, and at last there was no one so old or so weak as not to have come to seek fresh life and health and strength at this place. The concourse became so great that they were obliged, except at the hours of divine service, to keep the church and chapel closed. Edward did not venture to look at her again. He lived on mechanically. He seemed to have no tears left, and to be incapable of any further suffering. His power of taking interest in what was going on diminished every day. His appetite gradually failed. The only refreshment which did him any good was what he drank out of the glass which to him, indeed, had been but an untrue prophet. He continued to gaze at the intertwining initials, and the earnest cheerfulness of his expression seemed to signify that he still hoped to be united with her at last. And as every little circumstance combines to favour the unfortunate, and every accident contributes to elate him, so do the most trifling occurrences love to unite, to crush and overwhelm the unhappy. One day, as Edward raised the beloved glass to his lips, he put it down and thrust it from him with a shudder. It was the same and not the same. He missed a little private mark upon it. The valet was questioned and had to confess that the real glass had not long since been broken, and that one like it belonging to the same set had been substituted in its place. Edward could not be angry. His destiny had spoken out with sufficient clearness in the fact, and how should he be affected by the shadow? And yet it touched him deeply. He seemed now to dislike drinking, 
and thenceforward purposely to abstain from food and from speaking. But from time to time a sort of restlessness came over him. He would desire to eat and drink something, and would begin again to speak. Ah, he said one day to the Major, who now seldom left his side, how unhappy I am that all my efforts are but imitations ever, and false and fruitless. What was blessedness to her is pain to me, and yet for the sake of this blessedness I am forced to take this pain upon myself. I must go after her, follow her by the same road. But my nature and my promise hold me back. It is a terrible difficulty, indeed, to imitate the inimitable. I feel clearly, my dear friend, that genius is required for everything, for martyrdom as well as the rest. What shall we say of the endeavours which, in this hopeless condition, were made for him? His wife, his friends, his physician, incessantly laboured to do something for him. But it was all in vain. At last they found him dead. Mittler was the first to make the melancholy discovery. He called the physician and examined closely with his usual presence of mind the circumstances under which he had been found. Charlotte rushed into them. She was afraid that he had committed suicide and accused herself and accused others of unpardonable carelessness. But the physician, on natural and middle on moral grounds, was soon able to satisfy her of the contrary. It was quite clear that Edward Zen had taken him by surprise. In a quiet moment he had taken out of his pocket-book and out of a casket everything which remained to him as memorials of Ottilie, and had spread them out before him. A lock of hair, flowers which had been gathered in some happy hour, and every letter which she had written to him from the first, which his wife had ominously happened to give him. It was impossible that he would intentionally have exposed these to the danger of being seen by the first person who might happen to discover him. But so lay the heart, which but a short time before had been so swift and eager, at rest now, where it could never be disturbed, and falling asleep as he did, with his thoughts on one so saintly, he might well be called blessed. Charlotte gave him his place at Ottilie's side and arranged that henceforth no other person should be placed with them in the same vault. In order to secure this, she made it a condition under which she settled considerable sums of money on the church and the school. So lie the lovers sleeping side by side. Peace hovers above their resting place. Fair angel faces gaze down upon them from the vaulted ceiling. And what a happy moment that will be when one day they wake again together. End of chapter 18 End of Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe